A Sobo studio was founded in 2002 and found their groove in being a contract studio who made games for hire. They've developed several games under the Pixar license. They've aided Ubisoft in the development and porting of their games. And Microsoft has brought them in to revive their flight simulator title. Oh, and they also made a Monopoly game. But it was in 2019 that they released the most unexpected hit of the year, A Plague Tale Innocence. I am genuinely stunned that, among their unpredictable variation, they managed to develop an impressively captivating video game which looks as good as Plague Tale. Asobo's inexperience with designing a new IP and their relatively small stature as a development studio, totaling only 40 people, makes it ever more impressive that this game exists at all. Not only that, but it trades blows, particularly visually, with its AAA contemporaries. They are the veritable underdogs, and who doesn't love an underdog story? In terms of the game itself, it's about a lot of things. Rats, the Black Plague, bonking people on the head with rocks. But if you want to know what it's about, then there's only one answer. The relationship between two siblings, Amicia and Hugo, and the journey on which they partake. It's their relationship which is the beating heart of the game, with every other aspect working to support and enhance it. Simple in most of its design, the culmination of the striking visual presentation, a narrative shrouded in mystery, compelling voice work, and gameplay clearly designed to elevate the story, all serve to put the spotlight on the brother-sister bond. A lot of work is made early on in the game to present a grounded, believable world in order to tell a story it wants you to take seriously. The game rightfully deserves its praise for telling one of the most relatable human stories you can, that being the bond between two siblings in their formative years. But the game is definitely not without its flaws. In fact, the most frustrating thing about Plague Tale is how close it gets to a uniquely compelling story, but throws away all of that hard work in the second half of the game. But that isn't to say I had a bad time by any means. I'm going to dive into what makes Plague Tale special, and try and uncover exactly what it did to leave a lasting impression on so many who have played it. But in doing this, I also have to discuss its missing potential in the latter half, where it makes up new rules, introduces a villain which makes no sense, and creates confusing narrative threads which go nowhere, only to clash with the honest story trying to be told at the core of the game. Ultimately, the game has just as much soul as it does rats, and I look back at my experience with the Plague Tale Innocence loving it, but seriously frustrated at the same time, with a setup that's almost perfect, yet an execution both in the narrative and the gameplay in the final moments, which results in disappointment for what could have been. The early game truly sets up an interesting premise, which, at least for most of the game's runtime, is delivered upon. But the heart of the game is on display from the moment it begins, and, really, the opening serves as a good indicator for what's to come in the game's full stride, so I want to look at some of the details here first. The very first thing you notice from the moment you press new game is that the visuals, particularly the environments, are a remarkable spectacle. The game is set during the Black Plague in medieval France. This is a really unique setting. The game actually takes place in the same southwest region of France as the studio headquarters for Asobo. So the game is able to faithfully recreate the lush forestry and landscapes, as well as the medieval architecture of the setting. And all of these visual aspects flaunt their strong presence in the opening and are seen throughout the game. The star elements of the game though are the characters, and immediately we get a sense of who we're playing as. A young girl from a noble background, Amicia Darun. She's capable, but naive. Motivated, but inexperienced. And importantly, she cares for those around her. The opening sequence seamlessly integrates basic combat tutorials while allowing players to start bonding with Amicia and her family, including her canine companion, Leon. But we don't get a full feeling of the tone of the game until it starts flashing its darker side further through the opening. We get to Amicia trudging through mud and decay and she has to confront the desecrated body of her dog, whose death sets a tone of mystery and tragedy, furthered by the execution of her father shortly after. So one of the core conflicts Amicia has to face is presented here, 
a juxtaposition between Amici's carefree and fragile childhood against the more brutal and bleak experiences that she's forced into by circumstance. This occurs constantly throughout the game, and in terms of tone, it's one of the best things that it achieves. In the opening and throughout, this contrast is mirrored in the visuals, with just as much picturesque presentation as there is bleak and sombre imagery. There's a constant oppressive and disempowered feeling when playing as Amicia. This is certainly a unique angle, which is actually pretty rare for this corner of the gaming landscape, outside of more horror-focused games. More often than not, the player character is a veritable badass, placed into a power fantasy, able to take on hordes of enemies and come out unscathed from unimaginable odds. So it's weirdly refreshing to play a disempowerment fantasy. Plague Tale makes you the underdog, where it's a test of resilience and perseverance, not brute strength, which carries you against the odds. And, oh yeah, it makes things very tense, but also grounded. Now, I want to define what I mean here when I say grounded. What I don't mean is strictly realistic with respect to the world we live in. A story can be grounded in any kind of reality, even if that reality doesn't perfectly mirror our own. Instead, a grounded story is one where a world's set of rules are well established, and most importantly, are consistently adhered to. In this way, a grounded story is one that you can easily suspend your disbelief for, even if the fictional world itself has rules outside of our own, like sci-fi or supernatural stories, and so the stakes will always feel real. In Plague Tale, it's the characters which carry the bulk of the game, and if the world is grounded, we become invested in their relationships and well-being. We meet the sibling counterpart in the opening as well, Hugo. When Amicia meets him, despite being her brother, she hardly knows him. This is a really smart decision, since it means that both the player and Amicia are being introduced to Hugo at almost the same pace, and the game can then naturally build a sense of protective desire over Hugo and the player through Amicia's experience. The opening continues to show us what to expect in the rest of the game during the attack on the Darun's village, forcing Amicia to start taking care of Hugo. In these first moments, we see how Amicia is initially not capable of protecting another person, and isn't good at making Hugo feel comfortable. The first thing she does when danger approaches is to just leave him the fuck behind. She's been thrusted into a situation she's not equipped for, and the premise here is one where Amicia and Hugo's survival hinges on their ability to work together in these kind of life-threatening situations. It turns out that the reason Hugo and Amicia barely knew each other is because Hugo has a mysterious disease. Not only that, but Amicia says herself that she rarely even sees her own mother, Beatrice, because of how much time she spends trying to come up with alchemical cures for Hugo. The attack on the village was actually orchestrated by the non-Spanish Inquisition, and they're after Hugo. The narrative doesn't divulge the reason why yet, and in doing so sets up a perfect hook around the mystery of what this group of people want from Hugo, what this uncurable disease is, and how it all ties together. There are talks of a plague around the village, and this directly refers to the Black Plague, did you hear what happened at the village? People being bitten. Kids too, can you imagine? The game invites curiosity into how this impacts the story of the world. Shortly after the opening, we get to explore a different village, but one which is eerily empty, and one where most of the people you meet are trying to kill you. So it's not just the Inquisition who have seemingly lost their minds. The premise offers genuine intrigue, remains grounded, and the characters feel human. Well, for the most part anyway. There are a few oddities that start poking their way through the beautifully embroidered fabric of the game's opening. The main one is the dynamic between Amicia and her mother. There's a level of awkwardness between them which I can't tell whether is intentional or not. They apparently barely see each other, which, if true for the mother and daughter, you'd think would cause some friction. But once Hugo is in Amicia's care, they act like acquaintances, not mother-daughter, nor estranged family. I mean, sure they might have more pressing concerns here. But even so, something definitely feels missing between them. In fact, the notion that Amicia rarely interacts with Hugo at this stage of the game strikes me as odd. Their bedrooms are just five meters apart. They've both been living here for five years, and yet they hardly ever cross paths? It feels not quite right. And maybe that sounds like an unnecessary nitpick. I don't want to miss the forest for the trees. And some convenient level design might be what works best here if the player is able to bypass the environmental narrative dissonance of their rooms being all so close together in order to accept the story being told that they hardly talk to each other. It's just that a huge part of the narrative premise is that Hugo and Amicia are unfamiliar with each other. We spend most of the game watching their relationship develop from almost nothing. 
So for me at least, this issue stuck out far worse than it really should have. Small things like these don't ruin the presentation of the story by any means, but it does leave it at least somewhat blemished. Now, there's another significant detail about the game, and that is that it has a lot of detail. This is a very graphically impressive game for the small scale of its development, and it doesn't cheat. The studio made the engine for this game. The environments look dazzling, with a stylistically brilliant lighting, photorealistic modelling, and high resolution textures, so the game looks sharp and attractive. A lot of people would be quick to mention here though, that while this may be impressive, graphics don't make a game. While this is true, I think it's relevant to point out that if graphical fidelity can serve other elements of the game while resting on top of good art direction, which is arguably the most important part of a game's visuals, then fidelity can absolutely still add to a game. Nice graphics have their place, and I don't think anyone can doubt that they're executed well in Plague Tale. So how do the graphics serve the game? The bond between the art direction and the visual quality creates an unmistakably vibrant atmosphere. It's used to bring the juxtaposition between the delicate and fragile tone of Amici's background against the bleakness she has to face into focus in a literal sense. Seen a striking picturesque natural landscape in one chapter, and the horrors of a large-scale medieval battlefield in another in such detail allows these scenes to speak for themselves. The utility here is that when you can see just how beautiful something can be in this world, it gives so much more weight to how bleak they can otherwise be. So all of these elements present in the opening of Plague Tale come together to set up a grounded experience, and the gameplay is built to extend the grounded feeling of the game. This effect is clearest when looking at what you're doing for most of the first half of the game. That is, hiding and sneaking. Stealth is a core element of Plague Tale's gameplay. It's tutorialized in the second half of the game's opening. You do the standard crouch to be silent thing. You hide in bushes, behind waist high walls, and sneak around guards. Minor complexity comes from being able to throw rocks at objects to make noise, and expendable ceramic pots allow you to make distractions at a location of your choosing. One thing that makes this a bit strange though, is that the game is extremely rigid in the way that you approach these stealth sections. The number of solutions to encounters tends to be extremely small. Oh, there's a guard there, and it just so happens that a glowing metal bucket is right behind him. And when I throw a rock at it, it sounds like someone dropping a drawer full of cutlery. What was that noise? I can't possibly guess what I meant to do. The problem with this encounter is that there's literally only two solutions. Either throw a rock at the obvious distraction, or throw a pot right next to it instead. Since they're functionally identical, there's no benefit to using an expendable item, so there ends up effectively being just one worthwhile solution. And even when the only solution is to throw a pot, the game gives you more than the resources you actually need to get through the section. I think you're catching my drift now. Stealth encounters, particularly in the early sections, are not fundamentally about sneaking. They're effectively puzzles disguised as stealth gameplay with rigid solutions. Once I came to terms with this, I actually enjoyed the stealth a lot more. The main reason for its inclusion is a tonal one. Having to sneak, sneak around, around without alerting the guards adds to the sense of vulnerability, which is essential to the seriousness that the game is trying to give to the situation Amicia and Hugo are in. When you get caught by a guard, it's usually instant death. The game wants you to understand that Amicia is not a fighter. Instead, she needs to come up with smarter solutions. If this inclusion is via a somewhat contrived puzzle system with a stealth facade, then I can accept this, though I understand not everyone will. This isn't the main problem with the stealth though, at least from an enjoyment perspective. No, the main issue is that there are far too many sections that rely on you doing nothing but waiting for your turn to crawl from point A to point B. Let me show you exactly what I mean. We see these two guards. I can't attack them here, so it's a sneaking solution. The guard on the left is looking right at me, so the only thing I can do is throw a rock to distract him to the box in front of me, and sneak past when he's walking back to his post. However, on this attempt, I accidentally threw the rock too early and attracted the second guard on the right, who I was supposed to wait for to leave. Okay, so I have to try again. If I fast track through how long it took for me to wait for the second guard on the right to leave his distracted state and walk away, and for me to try again on the first guard and finally sneak out while his back is turned... I spend almost one and a half minutes doing absolutely nothing. Apart from throwing the second rock, I could have completely put my controller down for the entire time. It turns out the setting is not the only medieval thing about the game. The torture is too. This absolutely is not engaging at all, 
and it's the worst crime the game commits in terms of gameplay, second to the brain dead AI. What is it? What? Thankfully, this method of stealth isn't used in abundance throughout the game, but it's common enough that it's definitely frustrating, even on reflection. The stealth is at its best when you have a wide open area with lots of guards to sneak through. Suddenly, there's multiple solutions to the problem of how to get through an area. You feel like you're actually making some decisions, and there's a risk associated with these decisions to keep you engaged and linked to the tone of the game. Unfortunately, there's only really three sections by my count that do this, although one of them is almost a whole chapter, which I do need to give credit for. But stealth isn't the only method Amicia has to deal with all the men and their pointy sticks. Plague Tale also has a healthy dose of combat too. Amicia's main form of offense is her sling. This is actually a really cool concept. It's a unique weapon to be the primary form of attack in a video game, and it pairs with the resourceful and vulnerable nature of Amicia herself. I see it as a pretty iconic object that I heavily associate the game with. Primarily, it can be used to sling rocks, and as the game goes on, you can use alchemy to make more interesting projectiles. These other ammo types can make combat more varied and easier, and are also often needed for the environmental puzzles through the game. There's also an option to throw your projectiles by hand, including rocks, for a more precise but shorter range placement in these situations. In early game combat though, when the only options are picking up stones lying on the ground, the sling is not particularly strong. Well, in a sense. You see, most enemies have helmets on, and the sling does nothing against them, so you can't just attack anyone you want. But if you're put in an encounter with some helmetless guards, God rest their souls because they are absolutely and unbelievably fucked. The slingshot is always a one-hit kill, and the game's aim is hard lock-on with no option to toggle it off. I'll go into more detail about how this affects the combat experience later, but the combat generally has a hard time finding balance. In concept though, its simplicity accomplishes the goal of disincentivizing combat-focused solutions since most of the early encounters involve helmeted enemies immune to the sling. So engaging in combat quickly forces you back into stealth, which makes sense for a privileged 15 year old girl who doesn't typically murder armored guards in her spare time. It's a very grounded approach to combat, in concept. But rocks aren't the only thing you'll be picking up. Plague Tale does the standard collectathon slash craftathon thing where you have to pick up resources in the environment in order to make those various ammo types for your weapon, a la the Horizon games. The interesting twist that Plague Tale applies to this formula is that these pickups are also used for upgrading your weapon, crafting, and stealth abilities. It's kind of like what The Last of Us does with its pills, with the difference being that Plague Tale uses a shared resource pool between resources for crafting and for upgrading. There are some upgrade specific materials, but all upgrades require the general ammo making materials as well, and sometimes particularly valuable ones reserved for more powerful alchemies. The first impression of this system is a fantastic one. Suddenly, you're starting to become extremely conscious of your resource usage. It encourages careful consideration of whether you really need to use up certain ammo types for traversal and combat. It plays perfectly into the oppressive nature of the game's world, where you're surviving by a rat's whisker, and you're having to scavenge and make deliberate decisions about how to best use your scarce resources. Sure, some of the upgrades are pretty pointless. Like, why would I ever need to upgrade my crafting speed, when it already takes a negligible fraction of my time to do so by default? But the concept is still strong in how it resonates with the themes of the game. The other thing Plague Tale gets you to do is a lot of puzzle solving. There's not really too much to say here. A lot of the puzzles involve the rats, a core element of Plague Tale's identity, where if you get too close you'll very quickly get devoured. You have to use light to manipulate impressively large swarms of rats as you play video game Floor is Lava to avoid being eaten. There are sometimes interesting ideas used here that get you to think outside of the box, like having to use the pendulum motion of a chandelier to create a light path through the rats. But rat puzzles are more often used to provide some simple resistance to traversal. Just throw the right projectile at the right object and walk on through. They're used to slow down the pacing of the game when needed. Most of it works, but some of these are perhaps too slow, like when you have to wait painstakingly long for Hugo to move into a different position to progress. While the puzzles do open up a bit in complexity as your arsenal expands, they're ultimately straightforward traversal speed bumps. But the thing is, they're not trying to be high level logic problems, so to me, they're fine here. Ultimately, the gameplay isn't perfect, but it does what it needs to in order to serve the oppressive tone of the world. The tolerance of a lot of the gameplay shortcomings really depends on your expectations going in. If you know the stealth is simple, and the game is relatively small, 
then it's much easier to accept what's on offer and focus on the story at the heart of it all. I still believe that Asobo Studios has managed to put together a set of gameplay systems which resonate together really well and tell the story between Amicia and Hugo through their journey together. But when I look at the whole package together so far, the stealth combat gameplay, the resource-based upgrade system, a story about a protector and protectee surviving against the odds on an inspiring journey, it all feels very familiar. I've heard Plague Tale described before as, we've got the last of us at home. And while this is maybe a little bit unfair, there's some merit to it. A Plague Tale Innocence is similar in both narrative and gameplay to The Last of Us. Is this a problem? No, not necessarily. In fact, not at all really. Games get called clones all the time, and honestly, this does nothing but stunts the emergence of the growth in a genre. If it weren't for Doom clones, there wouldn't be the FPS genre. If it weren't for Rogue clones, there wouldn't be roguelikes. And if it weren't for GTA clones, there wouldn't be the open world sandboxes that have become the status quo today. You need to let people iterate on a formula that works. No art is created in a vacuum. So the fact that A Plague Tale adheres so closely to The Last of Us' formula isn't a bad thing at all, in principle. Am I saying that this is going to become a new genre? No. But it doesn't mean that the formula can't be evolved. Or even if it's not evolved, there's nothing wrong with a template being used to tell a new story and give some people some new set pieces to experience. However, there is a caveat to closely following the footsteps of a highly acclaimed game. It can lead to the borrowed elements lacking in the depth and understanding of what made them work in the original. Does Plague Tale make this mistake? I think for the most part, no. The dynamic between Hugo and Amicia at the core of the game has enough of its own uniqueness such that there are no distractions arising from comparison to what's come before. When you factor in that the studio who made Plague Tale was only 40 people big, not the AAA figure of Naughty Dog's hundreds who made The Last of Us, the simpler gameplay systems in Plague Tale are easier to accept, and most of the decisions make sense for the scale and tone of the game. There are a few exceptions though, where the comparison brings an eye to some things which are harder to forgive. For example, both games relegate upgrades to workbenches at fixed locations along the linear journey of each game. There's a very specific reason this was implemented in The Last of Us. During playtesting, Naughty Dog found that people were upgrading as they picked up parts and never went for the expensive upgrades. As a result, upgrading was too incremental and interrupted the flow of the game. The solution was to make rigid workbench locations, where players would have to make hard decisions about what upgrades they wanted to run with over the coming hours of gameplay until the next workbench, and it made sure that when players were upgrading, that they had enough resources to make a tangible change to the play system. In Playtale, they take this idea, but I'm not sure they've done it for the same reason. There's an upgrade that allows you to upgrade without a workbench. The fact that this upgrade exists at all completely negates the purpose of workbenches. Even if this upgrade didn't exist though, that wouldn't fix the fundamental implementation, since workbenches are far too common. I arrived at half of them with too few resources to upgrade anything at all, let alone the ones I wanted. Another confusing Last of Us facsimile in Plague Tale is the Luminosa Alchemy, which mirrors the Last of Us's expendable shivs in terms of their dual function, saving the player from certain death and unlocking resources. But it only works in The Last of Us because it serves an additional function. You can get easy clicker kills from stealth with a shiv. It adds a tense decision in combat, by making difficult encounters easier, but at the expense of possible resources later in a level. Plague Tale has none of this, since Luminosa has no combat function at all. So you quickly learn that the optimal way to use it is to simply hold on to one until you need to make a path to a resource location. The main reason the comparison to The Last of Us is useful is the insight that the whole reason The Last of Us works in the first place, and why it's praised so heavily still, is its unwavering commitment to a grounded and consistent world. Characters and events are all believable within its fictional universe, and the rules remain consistent throughout the high stakes journey. For Plague Tale to have the same success in its delivery, it would need to keep its grounded approach as well. That's why it's such a shame that the grounded nature of Plague Tale doesn't last for the whole game. It does pull off an engaging early game, but later on, unlike The Last of Us which uses its grounded world in interesting ways, it starts changing up its rules. For now though, I can appreciate what does remain grounded and engaging in Plague Tale. But oh boy, don't worry, I will talk about the parts where it doesn't. So is this comparison actually a problem for Plague Tale? Like I said, not necessarily. 
Successive versions of a formula are what create genres in the first place, but it's hard for the flaws not to become more obvious when viewed in comparison. Now, I don't want to sound like I want Plague Tale to do exactly what The Last of Us does. What makes Plague Tale so interesting is what it does to make its formula unique to itself. The elements like the sling as the main weapon, and of course the rats, give Plague Tale an exclusive identity and charm. That's right, the rats make Plague Tale Plague Tale. As the creative director himself said, If we had no, no rats, we had no games. And their inclusion was decided even before the characters. While the sling may serve as a unique weapon, the rats stand out as the most iconic element in the whole game. It is absolutely full of them, and it's one of the aspects the game nails from beginning to end. So I need to talk about them and their beady red eyes. With the game set during the Black Plague, there needed to be an interactive threat to associate this with. The devs have talked about initially considering more abstract ideas, like a fog that could harm the player as a physical representation of the plague. But this ended up feeling too supernatural for a game that they wanted to be gritty and realistic, so they settled on rats instead, which devour you the instant you try to occupy their space. They work fantastically as a representation of the threat of the plague, and allow for a physical interaction with something as ephemeral as a disease, while maintaining the grounded design of the game. Rats already have a natural connotation of filth and disease, and their visual design ramps this up to 11. They set the mood perfectly, and their creepy presentation made me feel crazy. Crazy? I was crazy once. Something to do with rats in a room? I don't know. Anyway, the point is, the rats are essential to the game's design both aesthetically and mechanically. This is why simulating massive crowds of them is the most important technical challenge the game tackles, and it really is a genuine technical feat that still impresses me four years later. In A Plague Tale Innocence, it's possible to have up to 5,000 rats on screen at once. Only 400 are ever individually rendered and animated as their own elements, but you'll never notice this. Every single rat you see appears authentic, even at the larger scale in the game, and this allows for ridiculous set pieces, which all hit their mark. But having enough rats on screen at once to even make my local dominoes blush means nothing if they're not convincing as real rats which pose a real threat. So many small details have gone into the animations and behaviour of the rat hordes which make them feel alive rather than just rat-shaped markers in a crowd simulation. In rare moments where you need to kill rats to progress, the Luminosa alchemy is needed. When you throw this on a rat-infested surface, it won't necessarily kill all of the rats. It's possible for a handful, or even a single rat to survive if you don't aim your throw properly, and they'll go on to behave as you'd expect a small group of rats to behave. Clearing rat crowds isn't just a press-to-win system. You have to treat them like a real force of nature, made up of individual creatures. When it comes to bypassing them, you use light as a protective aura. And one of the most striking details is the way these little cheese connoisseurs will overwhelmingly clamber and screech at the edge between light and dark if you approach the boundary. They absolutely fiend for a nibble on Amicia's organs, and beyond just giving life to the rats, it introduces ambiguity to the boundary between safety and death, adding to the tension. Being the exciting person I am, something I wondered about as I played the game was how the rat AI pathing was achieved. Having 400 AI objects in a game move around to their goal destinations is not easy to compute, and traditional per-AI pathing absolutely wouldn't work here. It turns out the solution is really interesting in how simple it is. Instead of each rat calculating their own path to a goal, the problem is solved in reverse. A single calculation of a vector field is drawn on a set of grids across the ground in a level, and each vector points towards a rat target. Rats just follow whatever direction the vector underneath them points, gradually moving them towards whatever rat food is in the vicinity. So rats don't actually have to think in an AI sense, they just flow towards a nearby target. All of these aspects of Plague Tale's rats make them really engaging to interact with. They make up the vast majority of the traversal puzzles in the game, where you have to play with light in an area to open up safe paths through the rats. It's a really unique approach to the use of lighting in a game like this. Of course, with stealth, you want to stick to the dark so as to not be seen. But now there's a new factor of the rats which make your brain say dark means danger too. So you rarely ever feel safe as you move throughout the game. I only wish this was capitalized on even more, with more areas containing both rat and human enemies that weren't filled with obvious light pockets for easy positioning. The rats lend so much soul to the dark mood of the game, and it wouldn't feel remotely the same without them. A lot of this comes from their visual design. 
They're blacker than real rats, and they have glowing red eyes. A really striking image when you see a group of them piled up in a dark corner. I mean, come on, tell me that isn't cool. This goes on to making the already rich atmosphere of the game even more incredible. The highs are high, and the rats make the lows despairingly grim. One of my favourite moments in the game is when you have to ascend to the castle that Amicia later ends up using as a base. The ascension takes place in the middle of the night during a thunderstorm. This is already moody as hell to begin with, but then the hordes of rats block your path. That is, until the lightning cracks, illuminating the sky and forcing the rats back out of your way. This is such a cool set piece in a game already filled with lots of genuinely good ones. When we break the game down though, it's not the rats which make the experience special, they just help to enhance it. No, the heart of the game is the duo relationship between Hugo and Amicia. From a wider lens, the game as a whole is strongest in its themes of friendship, family and connection. While the sibling relationship is at the core of these themes, there are many characters that Amicia meets along the way, and she ends up acquiring a band of merry children ready to try and help Hugo's macular degeneration. Uh, oh wait, I mean his prima macula affliction. This group of friends becomes a serious focus of the game, for better or worse. She first meets Lucas, an apprenticed alchemist. Lucas ends up tagging along with a sibling pair, and takes the place as the knowledgeable alchemist of the group. He teaches Amicia many of the alchemy recipes that can be crafted as sling projectiles, but more importantly, he becomes a character through whom Amicia can vocalise her thoughts and struggles. Soon after, you meet a pair of thieves, who themselves are also siblings, twins in fact, Melly and Arthur. These characters act almost as a mirror to contrast the sibling relationship of Amicia and Hugo, but have been together for much longer. The main difference though is that they've had a life full of hardship, in contrast to the more privileged upbringings of Amicia and Hugo. Lastly, you acquire Roderick, the stereotypical beefcake, who gets saved by Amicia from being tortured by the Inquisition. He embodies the emerging violent themes of the game, and serves as a vessel for Amicia's own anger and brutality. He's constantly going on about how carried away he gets with murdering people. Apart from this though, I'm honestly a little confused by his inclusion, since there's very little else he does outside of minor exposition. In any case, for a large portion of the game, there's a group of six children, the oldest of whom are Melly and Arthur at 16, and this crew becomes friends. They help each other out, and they work together to try and solve the mystery of the Prima Macula. What is it? Why is it only just now started showing? And why is it only affecting Hugo? You know, all the mysterious stuff. The game is fairly short at about 9 hours, so there's not a lot of dialogue between these characters. It's really Amicia and Hugo who steal the show in this department. What really makes their dynamic work is the excellent voice acting. Impressively, the dev team weren't the only people new to a narrative-focused video game. Both Charlotte McBurney and Logan Hannon, voicing Amicia and Hugo, were performing in their first professional voice roles. Given that fact, I am seriously impressed with the performances in the game. There's a bit of debate around this, but I found Hugo's performance really genuine and captivating, unlike a lot of typical child-acted characters who can come off as annoying. Charlotte's Amicia is the standout, with a performance that conveys a lot of emotional range given her character goes through a lot of traumatising experiences. I can't say the same thing for the animated performances, which can look a bit strange in contrast with the otherwise high fidelity. But I can give this a pass since it's already impressive that this game exists at all and is such a small studio in the first place. This culminates in it just working whenever the two characters interact. There's enough conversations between Amicia and Hugo that it's easy to be invested in them as a pair of characters. The game is very cutscene heavy, but these scenes are overwhelmingly exposition focused. The best moments actually occur in the middle of ambient conversations during gameplay. The way they talk in the cave after they're split off from the group feels genuine, and you can see Amicia starting to take on a guardian role over her brother. The underground lakes are magical. Huge, ancient monsters hide in their depths. And watch out, they're very hungry. No, they're not. And if there were monsters, we'd see some big bubbles. <laughs> you got me. Mummy used to say that monsters are just those things... Those things too. Just those things to which we have never given a name. She told me that too. I would quite like to see a monster actually. You see Amicia's dedication to Hugo ramp up through the game as she's forced to confront her capacity to keep Hugo safe. One of the headline moments for this is when she has to save him, but only if she can kill someone for the first time in her life. 
On paper, this is a great moment. She has to sacrifice her innocence to protect her brother. But the goofiness of the boss fight dampens this moment quite a bit, and it eventually leads to a Tomb Raider reboot-like character arc, and borrows a lot of the same pacing issues as she doesn't take long to become a killing machine. It doesn't mean that watching Amicia climb through dead bodies, face hordes of rats, and fight tooth and nail through the rest of the game has any less impact in convincing me of her dedication to her protective role over Hugo. You watch as both Hugo and Amicia lose their innocence amid the turmoil that ironically bonds them closer together. You realise that this is the transformation that's a crucial part of their journey. It's a reminder that growth always comes with challenge and sacrifice, much like how innocence is traded for the bond between the siblings. It might be a bit on the nose, but the game does live up to its generic subtitle. There's harmony from the gameplay side as well. Something I love about the game is the collectibles. Most of them are pretty forgettable, standard lore items with bland descriptions. But what's really cool is that Hugo has an interest in flowers, which he inherited from spending all of his time with his alchemy-trained mother while she was trying to cure him. So whenever you come across a collectible flower, Hugo enthusiastically runs up to it and tells Amicia what it is and what it's used for. He'll place it in Amicia's hair, and then she carries it around the rest of the level. The dialogue and the animation signal a wholesome bond growing between the two, and I never got tired of this. There's a few spots in the game where subtle animations make their relationship shine. They didn't have to add the piggyback animation here, but they did, and including these moments really pays off. There's also a mechanic where you're able to choose to hold Hugo's hand or let it go at the press of a button. Watching Hugo run up to Amicia and grab her hand is heartwarming, and it's something I love that the player has agency over. However, apart from one moment in the tutorial, there's not a single other time where this mechanic is actually necessary, or even beneficial to progressing through the game. It's a cool idea and concept, but I wish it was actually implemented in a substantial way so that I use the mechanic at all, since there's actually a lot of potential here. All of this culminates in a relationship I actually care about. The initial grounded tone and the themes of the game work together to shine a spotlight on the bond between the two siblings at the core of the game. However, the narrative splinters from this as it justifies their interaction through a plot of mystery around the Prima Macula disease, which I haven't really touched on yet. The question now is whether this mystery pays off in a satisfying manner. At this point, I've hopefully convinced you of the brilliance of the game's premise, but it's now time to address the elephant in the room and talk about the vertical cliff over which this game decides to jettison itself at the halfway mark. The elements of the game I've discussed so far have put in tremendous work in order to lay down a grounded foundation for the narrative to stand on. But then we start to gradually see where all of this mystery's been building up to beyond chapter 10 of the game, where it stops playing to its strengths and things get a little weird. What I mean by this is that the villain of the story suddenly gets introduced, Emperor Palpatine, French leader of the Inquisition. I think in the game they call him Grand Inquisitor Vitalis or something. It turns out, he wants Hugo's Prima Macula. Yeah, the disease. He wants it. Why? Well, in a truly confusing twist, his disease isn't just neck veins and occasional headaches. The big reveal is that the whole time, it's been secret rat powers. Hugo's Prima Macula allows him to mentally communicate with and control rats. Considering how grounded everything has been up until this point, this decision for the story is a contentious one to say the least. Now, don't get me wrong, a supernatural story can be captivating and well executed. Even in the game so far, the rats act under a semi-supernatural framework with a vampire-like aversion to light. Also, like, alchemy is real. But all of these things are established early on, and they don't change throughout the game in any major way, so I had no problem accepting their extravagant presence. The real problem comes as the game loses its grounded nature when seemingly random plot points stop you from being able to follow the rules established within the world. When I've been invested in the mystery behind Hugo's condition, and I want to find a cure for him, which is the entire goal of the game so far, I end up viewing the sudden swap to magic powers as a bait and switch, not a well-written twist. The consequence of this shift to an ungrounded narrative is that it removes all of the seriousness from the dark mystery themes that have been at the forefront of the game. This also means I lose some of my investment in the relationship between the characters. If I can no longer believe the world, how can I care for the characters within it? So first off, I mentioned earlier that there was a weird dynamic between Amicia and her mother 
due to the fact that they supposedly hardly saw each other growing up. You'd think that maybe something this substantial to someone's upbringing would come up again at some point, but it never does. In a coma dream, after Amicia bonks her own head for once, Hugo yells at Amicia calling her jealous. So she does have some guilt over her own envy of Hugo and Beatrice's relationship. But ignoring your own child is an objectively shitty thing to do, and the consequences of this are something which is never explored. There's one moment where Lucas and Amicia are looking for her mother's alchemy lab, and Amicia says her mother hid these kind of things from her. She told me nothing. I never saw her. So maybe we get to experience a consequence of her mother's distant treatment? Well, no, actually. Lucas figures it out literally three seconds later. Roman ruins. Yes, definitely an idea from an alchemist. Exactly where are they? The garden. Let's go. Maybe it's just me, but the whole thing was weird enough that it became distracting every time Beatrice showed up. In the opening, she's thought to be killed off screen, but another plot twist arrives where it turns out it was a servant who got murdered instead, and she managed to escape the attack. Unfortunately, her return only serves to provide some contention between Amicia and Hugo, since when Amicia learns of their mother's survival, she lies to Hugo about it. This is fine. It actually provides some friction in the siblings' relationship that they have to overcome. My problem is that when their mother returns to the plot, she provides absolutely nothing. There's no heartfelt reunion. She's just back. It doesn't change or add any more insight to Amicia's character at all, which feels odd considering she's literally her mother. Beatrice is, to me, the most annoying and bland character in the entire game, and I just wish she did at least one substantial thing. There's plenty more though. There's an interesting thread the game opens up when you revisit your home village after the rats have overrun it. The body of Amicia's executed father is completely untouched by the rats. That is, until Amicia approaches him and he gets violently swallowed up. Then, when you progress inside, all of the family's servants are being left untouched by the rats. Let's fast forward and see what the explanation for this is. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. The game never explains it. Yeah, seriously. I went through the rest of the game thinking this would culminate in something. Now, I'm not advocating that everything in a story needs to be explicit. Some things are better when they're left to interpretation. But there's so much of this stuff, these plot threads just come up to never be used at all, and as a result, it feels unfinished. A similar problem occurs when we look at the Prima Macula disease which drives the entire plot from the beginning. The whole journey is about figuring out the origin of the disease and trying to cure it. Well, that is until we learn it's just rat superpowers. But even once we get to the twist, we never learn why the Prima Macula has chosen Hugo. We never even really understand where it's come from or what it is beyond a vague historical reference. Spontaneity can work in a story. But the way it's presented here, it muddles the rules of the world. So the sudden hand-wavy explanation for the disease undermines the thematic seriousness it aspires to achieve. Some of these confusing narrative dead ends also apply to the side characters. Lucas, as an independent character, is fine. He drives the narrative forward by explaining some of the exposition behind the plague in Hugo's Prima Macula. Maybe his endless expertise at the ripe age of... 13? is somewhat questionable given how grounded everything else is in the first half of the game, but he is a likeable character and he gets things going. It's the interactions between himself and Amicia that make him worth having around. It's the other characters whose inclusion feels strange. Melly and Arthur are kind of confusing. There's friction between Melly and Amicia which goes nowhere. Who's going to pay us then? What are you talking about? Your mate's Lucas. He said you're rich. Just I... forget it, all right? Take Arthur's straw mattress and when he finally gets here, we'll have a proper discussion. This is never followed up on. At all. There's also some implied romance, I think, between Amicia and Melly's brother Arthur. He really saved our lives. It was incredible. Hey, don't get all lovey-dovey. He'll break your poor little heart. Yeah. I... <laughs> no. This begins before they've ever even talked to each other, and throughout the entire game, they share very few lines of dialogue, most of which are exposition. He ends up dying. Oh no. But his very little involvement in the plot makes it hard to feel anything for this moment. 
And I've already mentioned Roderick's inconsequential addition to the plot. He's also another character who dies towards the end of the game. To be fair here, he does die in sacrifice, and shortly before this you can bring him to his father's blacksmith station, who he clearly respects a lot. So his death carries some weight, and his arc has closure. Well, with what very little there was to make into an arc anyway. It becomes apparent that many of the side characters' potential for meaningful contributions to the narrative remain largely untapped. Character arcs and resolutions, crucial elements in storytelling, are left largely unfulfilled. So those characters might have some issues, but there is one who is much worse, and that's the main villain. Pope Palpatine feels like a bad, moustache twirling cartoon character with thin motivation. His inclusion doesn't play into the narrative strengths of the relationships nor the journey of the main characters. The only exception is that he brainwashes Hugo. I think. I don't know, it's not very clear. But the strength of their brother-sister bond breaks whatever influence is controlling Hugo. Outside of this, he has zero impact on their relationship. Apparently, Rat Pope's goal is to have Hugo all to himself so that he can have access to the power of the Prima Macula and, I don't know, take over the world, I guess. He pretty much just springs up out of nowhere to drive the plot forward off a cliff. All of the mystery surrounding the Prima Macula and the Black Plague is thrown out the window, unexplained. But I picked up an implication that Hugo's disease had something to do with the Black Plague, but that connection is never explained. It just seems that in times of great turmoil like a plague, a supernatural rat person gets chosen to control rats for whatever reason. Or maybe once someone gets chosen to be the rat guy, then a plague follows. I don't know, and the game doesn't explain it. For whatever reason though, the High Priest of Rodent seems to know everything about the Macula, but it's not clear how he knows this information. How come he gets to know everything, and I'm sitting here wondering where this rat voodoo came from? This is really disappointing, since it feels like the game is culminating to a much more interesting reveal. Or at least any kind of substantial reveal. But everything is so vaguely explained. The main mysteries from the game's setup end up remaining fundamentally unanswered, again, undoing the grounded first half of the game. A couple chapters earlier, Hugo ends up passing the first threshold, which apparently is when he can start controlling rats at will. All the while though, Count Rackula has been working on his own rat voodoo by bleeding people over the top of plague rats to make his own type of rats? Running with the general theme of the game's latter half, the logic here is also not really explained. But this is his attempt to make new white rats that he can control himself, and after a self-injection of Hugo's blood, he has some of the powers of the macula. This leads to the final boss fight with this guy where... Amicia runs around throwing rocks at his head, while Hugo and the Grand Inquisitor throw rat tornadoes at each other. I wish I was joking. The absurdity of this final fight was the nail in the coffin for me. I couldn't for a second suspend my disbelief anymore, undoing all of the impressive work building up an interesting premise. If I'm being as fair as I can, I can admit that the spectacle of the final fight is something worth admiring. It's a great technical use of the rat system, but tonally, this fight made zero sense to me. By contrast, if I look back to The Last of Us, that game gives a narrative conclusion that makes you reflect. You're faced with an ambiguous moral question that makes you wonder about what you'd do in a similar situation to Joel having to choose between the greater good or his personal attachment. I've never thought to ask myself what I'd do if Captain Ratman threw rat tornadoes at me. Plague Tale's ending doesn't say anything and it doesn't go anywhere after promising an interesting character-focused narrative. Not all stories need to feel profound or have some enlightened message at the end, but it feels out of place here to do absolutely nothing given the detail in the setup. The narrative isn't the only thing which is unable to keep up with the unpredictable momentum of the game. The gameplay suffers as well. It's designed around disempowering Nemesia, but the further you progress through the game, the more tools you acquire to start mowing down trained armoured guards. Pretty early, you get Deverantis, which is a projectile that melts off enemy helmets, making almost any enemy free game for Amicia's rock sling. This makes the game feel stuck in a strange place. Thematically, Amicia's toolset is designed around being resourceful and avoiding head-on combat, and the rock sling, with its slow wind-up, doesn't necessarily feel good to use on a lot of enemies in a row. The only mechanism which makes combat difficult is the wind-up time on sling throws. But since you're typically approaching encounters from a larger distance, you tend to pick off enemies extremely easily. 
so the scrappy, put-together feel of Amici's toolset creates a strange dissonance with the relative ease she ends up being able to mow people down with, and the gameplay feels stuck in a place not appropriate for the late-game action-oriented intentions. Oh, and remember before when I was talking about how nice the collecting slash crafting system was? Well, I wasn't telling the whole truth. It looks like a great system, or at least it was, until I realised how useless the upgrades actually are. While some are fine enough, the vast majority make no tangible difference to gameplay. For example, there's that one that just lets you skip using workshops entirely, or there's this other one which lets you use your sling to throw Luminosa, which you never have any use for that I was able to find. And there's one that lets you remove the need to use tools as a resource for upgrades, which is pointless since I was constantly shouting these things anyway. When I think about the upgrade system as a whole, it really feels like most of them are just there to pad out the number of upgrades in the game. Because most of the interactions in the game world are quite simple, there's not much room for a large upgrade system. But the impression I get is that the developers wanted the player to feel like resource collecting was important for the whole runtime of the game, and so made however many upgrades were necessary to cover that runtime. Not only that, but the rigid nature of the game means that both in combat and stealth encounters, you need whatever resources are required to sneak past an enemy or kill guards that are blocking your path, and the game has to supply you with them in that moment. You're never in any real danger of running out of items in such a way that progress becomes appreciably more challenging. So even if the upgrades were important, it wouldn't feel like you're making that much of a sacrifice in hoarding resources for those upgrades. Despite the game's warnings about resource management, the actual consequences for running out of essential items are minimal. To the game's credit though, it's actually quite difficult to get to the end of the game with everything fully upgraded. I actually think it might be impossible. So the resource economy fulfills the goal of making it such that the way you choose to spend your resources has a noticeable impact. The resource economy would therefore be genuinely amazing if only the upgrades and ammo use actually mattered. This is such a close win for the game, but the rigid game systems make these choices too unsubstantial to have much of an impact. But, and there is a big but for this, my frustrations with the resource economy only really became obvious towards the end of the game, when I was picking between a bunch of upgrades I knew would never make a difference now that I understood how encounters worked. However, in the first few hours of the game, I was actually pressured into making what I thought were genuine trade-offs. In that sense, the system works. It brings to life the feeling of scavenging to survive, which again, is totally on point. Having felt some of its potential, it only makes it more of a shame that the crafting and upgrading system doesn't work towards the tail end of the game. Ultimately, while the gameplay systems are not without their flaws, I still really enjoyed my time playing this game. Why? A game isn't just a superposition of its systems. Instead, it relies on a harmony between systems. Plague Tale's gameplay elements are all there deliberately to add to the core pillars of the game. There's an overall tonal match between them for the most part, which will link into the narrative and the set pieces. Before the epilogue, the best set pieces in the game are the ones that revolve around leveraging the depressing atmosphere to communicate the state of Amicia's mind. This is made possible by the powerful atmosphere, which actually gets stronger towards the end of the game, and watching Amicia have to trek through the impossibly large rat nests and start hallucinating all of the dead bodies she's killed puts a focus on her turmoil and guilt in a good way. Throughout the entire game, it's the rats which serve as a driving force behind the atmospheric tension which is constantly ratcheting up. They work in symbolising not only the external threat of the plague, but also the psychological weight on Amicia's shoulders. When looking at the game as a whole, there's a serious clash between the promising elements at the beginning of the game and the frustrating execution of those concepts. However, this doesn't overshadow the hard work put into the setup. I still look back on the game far more positively than not, and a lot of this has to do with the enduring strength of the characters, particularly Amicia and Hugo, who remain at the heart of the game for the whole experience. The game does have a saving grace at the very end. The epilogue chapter leaves a final positive impression, and I walked away being able to forgive the clashes between the promising premise and its execution. Amicia and Hugo are outcasted, relegated to the underdogs they were near the beginning of the game with no clear foundation to their future, but with lessons learnt about the importance of taking care of each other. 
as corny as it sounds, it's nice to see Amicia, Hugo and Lucas together at the end of the final chapter after going through such a harrowing journey. This is an excellent note to end the game on, focusing back on the grounded relationship between Amicia and Hugo, and it reminds me of why I love this game as much as I do. It harkens to the enduring strength that the game gives to Amicia and Hugo's characters, who remain the heart of the game for the whole experience. When I look at my experience with Plague Tale in the rearview mirror, I'm strangely enamored by it despite all of its shortcomings. The game still has plenty of positives, which for me are enough to make the whole journey worthwhile. I've talked plenty about both the good and the bad. I think for me though, I have a particular soft spot for a serious story about a journey which sparks a growing bond. The power of a fictional relationship like this is undeniable, and I imagine its impact hits harder for those with their own siblings. I can at least attest to that idea, since I was very close to my brother growing up. Even outside of that perspective, there's something everyone can relate to in the tribulations that come with moving through a challenging journey with someone that you care about, whether that be anything from tackling the world with a significant other, to solving a problem with your best friend, or surviving rat tornadoes with your little brother. There's enough honesty in Amicia and Hugo's relationship which has allowed the game to be able to resonate with as many people as it has. The other thing is, I have a lot of respect for the studio behind the game after taking the risk to bring an original idea to life in a landscape full of licensed franchises and endless sequels, and at a fraction of the comparative budget. In general, the prevalence of AA games has been on the decline for a long time now. Game developers become more and more complex, with higher expectations from gamers, and each game becomes a larger financial investment for the publishers behind them. Conversely, indie studios have lower budgets and smaller expectations, leaving this stage ripe for experimentation. It's the middle ground that gets left out, the AA developers. Too large to take experimental risks, yet too small to offer enough return on investment for publishers. A Plague Tale Innocence is a reminder that even in the midst of industry trends, smaller studios can create memorable and meaningful experiences. However, this isn't where the tale ends. The success of the game paved the way for a sequel three years later, A Plague Tale Requiem. This then begs the question, how well has Plague Tale refined its formula? Has the narrative evolved beyond its potential? And has it managed to overcome its flaws? Either way, the world created by Asobo Studios has already proven that the power of original storytelling can leave an enduring mark even within a medium dominated by giants.